So I'm Linda Joyce, and I'm the current president of World Wisdoms. And we have some housekeeping here. So um, restrooms are down here, through that door, not too far down the hall. And um, uh, refreshments are in the back. You're welcome to um, avail yourself of those. There will be a reception after the question and answer period, and we hope to stay for that. Uh, I'd like to thank many people who helped to organize this evening and the VN's lecture. First of all, our hardworking board, uh, our support quarter coordinator, Abby Bain, and you've seen her wandering around here. The VN's lecture committee, which was Tony Stone, Ruth Brenner, and Ruth is here tonight, and Howard Norris, and our volunteer videographer, Mark Freeman. So if we could give them a round of applause for all of us. And if you're new to World Wisdom's project, World Wisdom seeks to create opportunities through our programs in which the community can ponder together the challenges of our times in the context of sacred beliefs and wisdom. We seek to bring people of all perspectives of faith and belief together so that we may hear, see, and understand where we dwell in common. And tonight, as I mentioned, is the first Joe Comedians Lecture. World Wisdom's project evolved from an organization called the Theologian in Residence, which started over 40 years ago. Joachim Viennes was the theologian from 1974 to 2007, and this annual lecture aims to continue Joachim's work, offering opportunities for reflection on how faith and ethical traditions of the world speak to the needs of our culture, and how the needs of our culture call for a response by these traditions, and how, as individuals, we approach these needs in our lives and our communities. Now, I'm going to have Jim Reed, who has been a longtime board member, uh, come up and say a little bit about Joe Convenience. It's on. Can you hear me? Okay. I spent the day with Joachim and checking things out, and he's really pleased. <laughs> about so many uh, friends, long-term friends and colleagues, and all the love you gave him for so many years and all the support. So he's really happy. Uh, and I think he's with us. I think all of you know that. Um, also, he is really delighted about tonight's presentation and presenter, I think. Um, so first, he is pleased uh, that she's a woman, Dr. Minnie Sullivan, and she's also a gifted and outstanding scholar of religion. Um, when Joe came into the world of Catholic theology in the 1950s, uh, that field was completely dominated by male clerics. Um, and uh, after the Second Vatican Council and in the aftermath of that, um, the world of theology and the church began to evolve. And that evolution uh, changed that exclusive world of theology that was very dominated and opened it up to lay women and men. This development, um, this was a development that Joachim deeply, deeply valued and appreciated. He had a special fondness, though, for the sensitivity and gifts of the female spiritual te that female spiritual teachers brought to the world and to him personally. There's a very, very long list of female spiritual uh, teachers and thinkers who just were so, so important to him as he evolved personally and professionally. So this is kind of in continuity with that, too. Secondly, Joe Cummins, one of his special gifts was his ability to be a bridge uh, and a mediator between the academy and the broader non-academic world. He had a special gift at being able to take the insights and understanding, understandings of the academy and bring those in an understandable way to the broader community. And we're all beneficiaries of that gift of his for so many years. Winnie, I spent a lunch with her today and she has that same gift. So we're going to be blessed by that tonight. Also, the topic of tonight's presentation is one that was very close to Joachim's heart, too. 
uh, spring of 1984, he came to my office and invited me to join him uh, for my first trip to St. Benedict's Monastery in Aspen. And the invitation was connected uh, to his desire to um, attend the Aspen Institute. And at the Aspen Institute that summer, David Tracy, who was a theologian at the uh, University of Chicago, and one of Joachim's favorite mentors, was doing a seminar uh, for about a week. And the title of that seminar was Theology in the Public Realm, which is sort of exactly what our presenter tonight is also going to be talking about, religion and, and how that fits into the public realm. So uh, he's delighted with you're here, Wendy's here, and what we're talking about. So I'm going to turn this back over to Linda. Well, I get the opportunity to introduce her, and we're really fortunate to have her as our speaker tonight. A little bit about her um, education. She has a Bachelor's Arts in Theater Arts from Cornell. She has a law degree from the University of Chicago and a PhD in Religion Studies from the University of Chicago. She is currently a professor in the Religious Studies Department at Indiana. They have 22 faculty in that Religious Studies Department, so it's a very diverse um, department. If you think of any faith tradition, there's probably someone teaching that at that school. She's also the director of a new institute at Indiana University entitled Center for Religion and the Human. And we might ask her in the question and answer to say a little bit more about that. In reading about Dr. Sullivan, it's apparent that she's used her experience as an attorney, as well as her scholarship of religion, to make considerable contributions to an understanding of the relationship between religion and law in American society. She has many publications, including uh, the book, A Ministry of Presence, about chaplaincy, spiritual care, and law. We have a uh, display copy back there. But I think what really tells us quite a bit about Winnie is that in 2017, she was awarded a very prestigious award called the Martin E. Morty Award. And this award recognizes extraordinary contributions to the public understanding of religion by an individual whose work has relevance and eloquence that speaks not just to the scholars or the academy, but to other publics as well. So I'm excited to introduce the first Joel Convien's lecturer, Dr. Winifred Fowler Sullivan. Please help me give her a warm welcome. Religion shape each other in the modern period. 
so roughly the last 500 years. About chaplains in particular, I'm interested in the way in which their work has been normalized in American law. Suddenly, and it does seem in some ways suddenly, suddenly we are all in need of spiritual care, and institutions of all kinds, including parts of the government, are hiring chaplains to do that work. Now, from what you remember from high school constitutional law, that should be surprising to you. If you were constitutionally minded, you might think that for the government to be hiring religious specialists to do religious work is exactly the kind of thing that the Constitution prohibits. Don't we have a separation of church and state? Well, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution actually says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It doesn't mention separation. And I would argue that we don't actually have the separation of church and state in the United States, and we never have. But we do have disestablishment, and that's something that's distinctively American, uh, the way in which uh, religion is uh, not established by the government. So the question, in a sense, this evening is, isn't hiring chaplains a kind of establishment of religion? How and why American law has come not to see it that way is what I will describe this evening. That is, how the language that's used by chaplains and chaplaincies today, that is the language of universal spirituality and spiritual care, neutralizes the First Amendment and permits not just the hiring of chaplains by government, but also their close legal regulation and supervision. A ministry of presence, you might say, is a way of making religion legal. Now let me start by introducing you to a chaplain working in government today, the Reverend Kate Graystrup. She works as a government paid chaplain to the game wardens of the state of Maine. In a 2006 interview with Public Radio, she explained her job, beginning with the day when the warden service was engaged in a hunt for a lost child. The child's anxious mother was surprised and delighted to find that Kate Braystrup was there. It's so cool that the warden service has chaplains, Marion Moore said to her, just moments before the call came in that Allison, her lost child, had been found. Kate Braystrup was also surprised and delighted as she told the NPR audience that the main uh, service had chaplains. The first time I put on my uniform and looked in the mirror, I thought, this is really cool. I put my warden service ball cap on, adjusted the plastic tab uh, on the back to account for my big fat head, and then I slid the little vinyl boomerang into my collar, the sliver of white that transforms my ordinary shirt into a clerical shirt. It was a startling moment, that first look in the glass. The character I resemble most, I decided after some reflection, is Father Mulcahy from Mam. <laughs> this is an audience that actually laughs. <laughs> and why not? Why not, she thought. Like him, I'm a sort of generic ecumenical <coughs> clergy person rep representing the God that even atheists pray to. An undemanding character. So 60 years after the Korean War, more than 40 years after MASH first played on TV, a Unitarian woman in a Roman collar describes Father Mulcahy's role as having served a universal and gender-neutral spirituality, rather than the particular needs of Catholic soldiers needing an authorized dispenser of sacraments. In those 60 years, the role of the chaplain, both in the military and in other spaces, has been transformed. <coughs> Father Mulcahy may have ministered to all, but he did so as priest of a singularly bounded church. In 1950, it would have been very unusual to describe a Catholic priest as a generic ecumenical clergy person representing an undemanding God. So then Braystrup continued describing her work as a chaplain to the NPR audience. As we encounter each other in search scenes and debriefings, over bleary-eyed breakfast at a truck stop following a long night's short search, and meet at promotion ceremonies and flag-waving parades, 
As I preside over funerals and weddings, welcome the birth of children, and sympathize at the death of friends, the relationship between chaplain and warden grows and deepens. What Marion Moore actually said when her it was, it's so cool that the warden service has a chaplain to keep us from freaking out. <laughs> ah, I smiled. I'm not really here to keep you from freaking out. I'm here to be with you while you freak out. <laughs> <laughs> or grieve, or laugh, or suffer, or sing. It is a ministry of presence. It is showing up with a loving heart. And it is really, really cool. Grace Grubb, then, is not there, she says, to keep you from freaking out. She's there to be with you while you freak out. So it is what is called a ministry of presence. Grace Grubb gave uh, National Public Radio audiences a further example of her work on the Maine coast, describing a morning spent riding with Rob Greenlaw, one of the wardens, on his beat. It was March, and the weather was warm enough to melt most of the snow. We headed down Route 1 towards Millboro, then turned down one of the scrawny peninsulas that dangle off the mainland into Penobscot Bay. We were on a narrow winding road, chatting about this and that, when a car came screeching out of a driveway in front of us and took off, hitting 60 before Rob caught up with it, siren whooping and blue lights clacking and flashing along the front window of the truck. As she explained further, Maine game wardens have the same statewide jurisdiction, the same arrest powers as Maine state troopers, and they are empowered to do traffic, shop, traffic stops. Rob returned to the truck after talking to the, uh, the driver of the car. He says he peeled out of his driveway because he was late for work. I asked him if he'd had a fight with his girlfriend. He said no, just late for work. He just does it that someway, sometimes. I told him he ought to relax a little. And then they move on to investigate a possible illegal killing of a moose and a coyote. Further down the road, Rob showed me a little patch of sumac and birch where someone had hauled a dead moose to use as bait for coyotes. Being in possession of a moose carcass, even assuming the guy didn't shoot the moose, is illegal. But the perpetrator would probably hold his hand over his heart and swear that moose just happened and drop dead of natural causes right in the base of <laughs> Above the moose carcass, the corpse of a crow dangled in a sapling. They hang up a dead one to scare the other crows away, Rob said. Crows would eat the carcass before the coyotes came, and a big crowd of crows will bring the wardens. We look for them. Deputy wardens, we call them. <laughs> she then explains Rob's theory of the criminal personality. Rob wants to catch this coyote hunter. Rob knows who he is, can identify him by the wet prints of his truck tires on the road, and says he's a mean guy. As with so many criminal offenders, those willing to commit one crime are generally willing to commit a rack of others. And in fact, this moose puncture is well known to area wardens and troopers as a domestic violence drug and traffic offender. A scoff law is a scoff law. This is the warden's work, enforcing the traffic laws, protecting coyotes and moose, and partnering with state troopers with respect to a range of other offenses. So Grace Scrub's relation to what she calls the warden's work is somewhat ambiguous, as is the relationship of all chaplains to the work of the institutions in which they do their ministry. She is present to the wardens as they enforce the law. She ministers to the public, with whom they come into contact, she is, in a sense, both a bridge builder and a whistleblower, as others have described the work of chaplains. In her book about her ministry, Braystrup explains why she decided to work in law enforcement to chaplaincy. If you prefer applied and practical theology to the more abstract and vaporous varieties, it is difficult to find a more interesting and challenging ministry than a law enforcement chaplaincy. Law enforcement officers, like all human beings, are presented with grand questions about life's meaning and purpose. They consider the problem of evil, the suffering of innocence, the relationships between justice and mercy, power and responsibility, spirit and flesh. They ponder the impenetrable mystery of death. I was sure that working with cops would take me right up to where the theological rubber meets the road. 
She concludes her account saying, it is Gordon Greenlaw's job to get out of his truck and walk through the quiet woods as the maples swell and leaf. His job to stand and gaze across a shining lake, the scent of moss rising, birdsong in his ears. It is my job to go with him. So Kate Graystrup is an ordained minister in the Unitarian Universalist Church. She holds a Master of Divinity degree from Bangor Theological Seminary, and she has a certification in clinical pastoral education. And her careful, uni carefully universalist account of her work is very similar in tone and structure to many other descriptions of the work chaplains do all across this country, in VA hospitals, in prisons, in military, in schools, in workplaces, in airports, in businesses. Chaplains are now everywhere. So what kind of religion is this seemingly slight and ephemeral practice? And how does it fit into the constitutional framework we set for legally managing religious life in the United States? Is it a conformist kind of religion that accepts law enforcement's categorization of people as law biters or law breakers? Or is it a place of resistance to the modern state and its ways, sometimes standing with the Scott law and his journey? Is the world being sacrificed through these activities, or is religion being secularized? Chaplaincy as a religious practice sits at the intersection of democratic governance and the multiplicity of religious ways of life in the United States today. It interestingly epitomizes many of the ambiguities inherent in imagining religion under the modern rule of law. Chaplaincies both normalize religion through the situating of religious work alongside that of other modern bureaucracies, and it sets it apart through the multiple allegiances of the chaplain herself. It is an unstable encounter between strangers, strangers stranded in the gaps created by modern life. So tra chaplains trained by and sometimes disciplined by individual religious communities minister to a clientele often unmarked at that moment by any religious identity. And they do so on behalf of a secular institution bound, at least theoretically, to rational epistemologies. The chaplain, in a sense, has, without paradox, become a priest of the secular. I first became interested in the legal problem of chaplaincy when I read about a lawsuit brought by the VA against the VA by the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which challenged the constitutionality of their administration of the hospital chaplaincy in VA hospitals. Among the long list of concerns uh, in the complaint, FFRF alleged that as a part of the evaluation of each patient's health care needs, the VA requires that a spiritual and pastoral care screening assessment be provided to each patient as part of the interdisciplinary admissions process. VA chaplains then are determined the need for any pastoral care interventions and to prescribe, in effect, spiritual uh, care. This practice, FFR, FLH, is intended to promote religion and belief rather than to accommodate free exercise rights of, of veterans. Uh, so FFRF, if you don't know this group, the Freedom from Religion Foundation is one of the most active litigators uh, trying to enforce the separation between church and state. Like the ACLU and Americans United uh, for separation of church and state, these groups mainly exist in order to sue the government to try and prevent any kind of uh, religious uh, work or religious life sort of encroaching on government work. Um, you might have seen their ads. They have ads on the sides of buses that say things like, sleep in on Sunday morning. <laughs> They're sort of charming uh, in their atheism. <laughs> the Department of Veterans Affairs, as you know, is an executive agency of the US government charged with the responsibility, among other things, of providing health care to veterans, as well as to their eligible family members and survivors. Uh, Millions of people receive their primary health care through VA facilities. And more than half of the physicians practicing in the United States have had a part of their professional education in the VA health care system. 
and as FFRF alleged, the VA also provides spiritual care to these patients. The VA chaplaincy traces its beginnings to the Homes for Disabled Soldiers established by President Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. But the formal existence of the VA chaplaincy as a fully institutionalized national service began after World War II with the first appointment of a chief of chaplaincy services. And today, VA chaplains trained by the Red Cross and by the Department of Homeland Security are listed in a national computer database, allowing them to be electronically deployed as first responders in the event of a national disaster, along with chaplains from other government services. So what gave rise to this lawsuit, the reason why FFRF had uh, its attention drawn to the VA practice of the chaplaincy was a shift in the location of the chaplaincy within the VA hospital system. It had evolved, it seemed, since its founding from a focus that what the court called sacramental to a new focus that it termed clinical. So according to the VA's official history, the national chaplaincy was originally assigned to the Office of Special Services, which also included the departments of recreation, canteen, athletics, and patient welfare. So this sacramental, older system of supplying opportunities to access religious services on a piecemeal demand basis as an auxiliary medical care, like sports and snacks, um, <laughs> has now shifted so that the chaplain now became a part of the clinical health care uh, team. And it was that that FFRF objected to. They wanted to keep religion in the Department of Sports and Snacks. <laughs> so this new clinical chaplaincy is, is really differently conceived. The chaplain has now become a member of the team. And as the Wisconsin court explained, in order to effectively implement its clinical chaplaincy program, it was now reorganized under the Medicine and Surgery Strategic Healthcare Group. The purpose of this reorganization was to recognize VA's chaplaincy as a clinical direct patient care discipline. So religion, in the words of FFRF, had become a health benefit, and the government provided health benefit. So every new patient was now to be given initial spiritual screening and assessment, and recommendations were to be made considering his spiritual care. No longer an occasion for occasional divine communication through an optional, optional sacramental intervention, the new VA chaplain will assess and minister to a patient's spiritual needs as a routine and ongoing aspect of his medical care. And the court explained this shift, saying that today's clinical chaplains draw from both the behavioral sciences and theological reflection in understanding the human condition and providing pastoral care need not involve religion at all. Indeed, the court went on, according to VA definition, spirituality is not necessarily religious because it concerns the meaning of life on a more general level. So what was seen by FFRF as an unconstitutional sacralizing of health care was seen by the judges as a secularizing move. So that by calling it spiritual care, by calling this something that was a universal need, it kind of uh, fixed the constitutional problem, if you like. And it's not just in VA hospitals. Spiritual care is mandated by the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, which regularly reminds all hospitals that the commission requires them to provide a spiritual assessment as part of the overall assessment of the patient, and to determine how the patient's spiritual outlook can affect his or her care, treatment, and services. So defending its new chaplaincy practices, the VI argued in this case that what the FFRF derided as a violation of the Establishment Clause, that is, government-funded faith-based treatment, is constitutionally permissible because spiritual assessment care are fundamentally not religious and are a natural and necessary part of the health care. So the court agreed, and that was uh, the decision in the case was in favor of the VA. I was somewhat surprised by this decision, but I was particularly surprised by the way in which the judges seemed to entirely take in 
in this trend towards uh, redefining religion as spiritual care. And as I researched the case, focusing first on the practices of spiritual assessment, I was led to the role of the chaplain in this new dispensation. I, I became fascinated by her role. But let me step back for a moment and tell you a little bit of a longer history of the chaplain. Because there is, uh, it's also surprising uh, not only that religion has become uh, something that I would call religion, spiritual care has become a part of health care, um, but also it's somewhat surprising that the chaplain, which, who originated as a medieval office in the Catholic Church, has become the main provider of spiritual services in the United States, which is largely been a Protestant country. Um, so the chaplain is, is really foreign historically to Protestant that's a little different in the Church of England, but that's a special case, I'm sure you know. Um, so the ambiguities of the role of the chaplain, both free and yet not free of the structures of authority of both church and state, is an old story. It begins in the early Middle Ages with the introduction of chaplains into the Roman army. With the conversion of the Roman Empire and the gradual shift from penance being a once-in-a-lifetime right to its repeatability as a form of ongoing moral discipline, the need for priests in the military became acute. And in the mid-8th eighth century, uh, bishops began to issue specific instructions for the religious care of soldiers and to define the role of the military chaplain. So among other duties, celebrating mass, hearing confession, preaching, and praying for victory, it was also the medieval military chaplain's duty to carry relics into war. And these roles were all given particular prominence in the Crusades of the 12th century. It's a long and complex story. My apology to the historians here, but we're going to fast forward now. Um, because the role of the chaplain shifted in the early modern period as newly centralized monarchies in Europe used chaplains to consolidate control of their populations. In England, for example, the Tudor, Tudor era reorganization of the royal hospitals. So this is really, in a sense, some people think uh, it was during Tudor, uh, Tudor uh, monarchy that, uh, in a sense, the welfare state in England was invented. It was uh, the institutions that were built by the Tudor kings, including the modern hospital. And that these hospitals shifted from what had previously in medieval hospitals been a focus, a focus on salvation. They, of course, couldn't do much else for the patients. Um, but the new Tudor hospitals focused much more on uh, the, having the chaplains uh, work to um, make the patients into, mainly destitute patients, because the others were taken care of at home, into good workers for the new uh, modern state. So as Chris Swift, an Anglican chaplain and author of a wonderful book on hospital chaplaincy in the UK explains, the patient now receives the chaplain as part of the new religion of the state, in which sovereignty unites temporal and spiritual power. The chaplain is charged with making the patient compliant to authority, a willing worker who contributes to the commonwealth. And Swift traces the public role of the chaplain as agent of the state through the workhouses of Victorian England and the post-war establishment of National Health Service in England to its reform by new labor in the 20th century. So histories of chaplaincy are full of such stories, uh, stories of kings and generals and other privileged and powerful folk demanding from their chaplains religious blessings on their military and other adventures. Some of them, of course, comply in the U.S. notoriously in the Vietnam War, uh, when uh, Vietnam War era chaplains cheered on the slaughter. And others have heroically maintained a moral stance on war and other social issues, in opposition, you might say, to the powers that be, on behalf of prisoners and other outcasts. And I think for this audience, on the waterfront, <laughs> Cast your minds back a bit to that film and uh, the 
heroic chaplain in that film who works on behalf of dock workers uh, in their uh, effort to gain rights on the waterfront. So who does the chaplain work for? The church? The state? God? God is not much mentioned, as you notice. So law structures the work of chaplains in the U.S. in various ways. So now I'm going to show you that I actually am a lawyer. And I want to talk a little bit about the way in which the, the work of the chaplains is really highly regulated. Their work, um, Ministry of Presence, in a, is in a sense a creation of American law. All workers and employers in the United States are subject to them. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. Everything we do is subject to law, and all the religion in this, in this country happens in places defined by law. We don't like to think that. We tell ourselves a story that we have free religion. But I want to tell you a little bit about how chaplaincy in particular is structured by law. So all workers and employers in the US are subject to many individual and collective labor and employment laws, including minimum wage, job labor laws, fair bargaining laws, anti-discrimination laws, safety regulation, tax laws, laws promulgated at every level of government. And certain occupations in the U.S. require a formal state license and specific credentials before it is legal to practice them at all. Barbers and hairdressers, debt collectors, health care workers, lawyers, embalmers, engineers, architects, and so on. Religious professionals in the United States are not formally licensed by the state as they were historically in many countries and in many countries still are. American ministers and other religious leaders are licensed to preach by their own communities or they are self-appointed. But all chaplains hired by the government must meet minimum government set and managed qualifications for employment which define what counts as religious work. And the three credentials most often required as a chaplain today are the same ones that uh, I mentioned with respect to Kate Braestro. Them give degree, clinical pastoral education credits, and an ecclesiastical endorsement. So if you were a young person in the U.S. contemplating a career as a chaplain, and many do, it is increasingly likely that you will consider the path to such work to be through the acquisition of appropriate degrees, certifications, and internships parallel to those in other careers or fields you are considering. Sometimes entirely independent of uh, any church community, but perhaps a parallel to ordination or whatever method your own community has for selecting and training uh, their leaders. So all three of these requirements, the MDiv degree, CPE credits, and ecclesiastical endorsements, have their origins in Protestant institutions and have historically been controlled by mainstream Protestant churches, although that is changing. The content and style of the training that they represent also imply theological positions and practices that are deeply Protestant in structure and orientation. But all three have been embraced by evangelical and Pentecostal Protestants across the spectrum, as well as by Catholics, Jews, and other non-Protestants. These credentials have adapted themselves to the religious diversity of the U.S. The egalitarian ethos of credentialing generally, you see in how this method of qualifying yourself to be a chaplain does not depend on the discernment of leaders or, or decisions made by religious communities, something that you yourself, just as if you were going to be a nurse or something else, that you have egalitarian access to these, to these kinds of credentials and training. And it's a new kind of naturalization of spirituality. And all three of these are being shaped and are formed through a cooperation between government agents and private religious bodies, a cooperation which results in a kind of standardization and professionalization of the services provided, and a kind of homogenization, too, uh, so that they're recognizable. So let's consider briefly each of these credentials. So the MDiv degree is the most common degree for religious professionals today in the U.S. It's a three-year degree that corresponds to other degrees that credential students as professional rather than academic work, such as the MBA, the MFA, JD, and various degrees in the healthcare fields. But this is actually very recent, and if you think back, um, the ways in which religious leadership 
model was chosen in many communities, including many American Christian communities, was really charismatic rather than through book learning. In fact, there was a real reaction in the beginning of the U.S. against the kind of uh, university-educated uh, clergy that were uh, dominant before the revolution, that's Presbyterians and Congregationalists, um, went to Harvard, Princeton, or Yale, right? And after the revolution, the growth of Baptist and Methodist was partly through volunteer, part-time clergy who were not university trained, but who spoke from the heart and from a sense of personal call. So by standardizing this new sort of university approach to um, training as a religious leader, it's a real shift in what it what what counts as being a religious leader, how a religious leader ought to be selected. And so all of these men and did programs are also given legitimacy by accrediting, accrediting bodies that are endorsed by the US Department of Education, including the Association of Theological Schools. So if you're one of these young people who wants to be a chaplain, you can go on to the US Department of Education website and check out whether the school that you're considering going to is accredited um, and approved by the United States government. I hope you begin to see how entangled uh, these religious uh, practices, this religious training, uh, this religious work is with, uh, with the government. So CPE certification is also required for most government and private chaplaincy positions. And clinical pastoral education is a really interesting and very specifically American and partly Canadian uh, development uh, in the 20th century. Um, and it was a, an aspect of a broader engagement with modern psychologies, first by mainly by liberal Protestants, but later by all American clergy. So while Christians, lay persons as well as clergy, like many other religious persons, have always understood visiting the sick and caring for the otherwise disadvantaged to be a religious obligation, in the 20th century, particularly within Anglo-American Protestantism, a new hybrid practice was developed, a clinical practice that was formally understood to be distinct from the work of the congregational ministers on the one hand and doctors and nurses on the other. And this new practice would be the work of a new kind of healthcare professional, the professional hospital chaplain. And new psychologies were combined with traditional clerical forms of ministry in formal internships that taught ministers to convert their traditional forms of counseling into what might be called a form of religious psychotherapy or therapeutic religion, specifically tailored for the modern hospital setting. So for, for those trained through CPE programs, Spiritual health is understood to be a necessary, integral, and universal component of good health care. And human beings, all human beings, are understood to be spiritual as well as physical. So while the story of the reception of various psychological and psychoanalytic ideas of the human into religious ideas and practices in the United States is complex, and not always easy, the existential encounter with the patient, one which emphasizes listening, remains at the heart of Pastoral education today. And hospital chaplains today see their work as founded in understanding illness as creating a crisis of meaning for patients, one that demands specialized care. The Association for Clinical Pastoral Education, which administers CPD certification, is also listed on the U.S. Department of Education website. And CPE is now uh, trained. Uh, chaplains who work in other domains, not just in hospitals today, so that CPE training is often required in other kinds of chaplaincy, uh, as well as hospitals. Uh, so this particular form of hybrid uh, new religious uh, psychological practice is, is foundational for much of chaplaincy work. So finally, and this is actually in some ways the most peculiar of the credentials, ca candidates for chaplaincy positions must usually submit an endorsement from their faith community. And this endorsement certifies that the candidate is a member of good standing with the religious body in question and constitutes another interface between private regulatory regimes of the church and the government. So um, the Armed Forces Chaplain Board posts online a list of more than 200 currently approved ecclesi ecclesiastical endorsing organizations a list which is used by other government agencies as well. 
It's a curious group, including Baptists, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, Native Americans, Quakers, lots of Pentecostals, and every possible kind of ecclesial and quasi uh, ecclesial body, including Buddhist Churches of America, Camelback Bible Church, First Church of Christ Scientist, Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Basilopolis, the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, and 25 different kinds of Baptists. <laughs> Joining this list is basically a matter of applying and qualifying as religious organizations for purposes of the IRS. So the military endorsers are gathered together in this national conference on ministry to the armed forces, and this highly diverse group. And yet there is a sense that by being on this list and attending their conferences, at which you, are lear you learn uh, the way in which the military regulates spiritual care, that means that you must um, minister to all comers, you can't discriminate, among other things. You are agreeing that you're doing the same kind of thing providing the same kind of service, that is, supplying trained persons to minister to the spiritual needs of Americans. And a simple graphic design combining an American flag and a shepherd's crook decorates the Army Chaplaincy website. So again, if you want to get a job as a chaplain delivering spiritual care to Americans, say at a VA hospital, but also for a sports team or an airport or a college, you will need an MDiv degree in any religious tradition or none, an internship in pastoral care, and endorsement by any religious body that can fill out a government form. And you will be joining a profession that ministers to law by law, and which increasingly defines itself with reference to legally regulated professional standards rather than traditional religious authorities. So what unifies and justifies this ministry and this is also one of the most interesting things I learned in the course of working on this book, is presence. A form of empathetic, empathic spiritual care is, that is at the same time deeply rooted in religious history and suffused with religious references for those who can read them. One of the things that I think is most interesting about presence and the ministry of presence is that like spiritual care, it, it sounds as if it is not specific to any religious tradition. And yet, of course, it comes deeply out of the, Christ out of the Christian and other traditions. It has, it has deep resonances in particular. Uh, and yet it seems to be a religion stripped to the basics, religion naturalized, religion without code, cult, or community, religion without metaphysics. It is religion for a state of uncertainty, I think. And we live in uncertain times. As is typical of American religion, it both resists specific theological elaboration and is deeply rooted in a specifically Christian theology. If one listens to current users of the concept, a ministry of presence may seem to refer to the simple presence, the physical presence of the chaplain or the minister. That is, the ministers or the chaplain's willingness simply to sit with, and this is the language of CPE, sit with a client without anxious expectation. And that last part is very important. So that the chaplain begin, uh, brings to the encounter uh, no insistence on particular religious practices or religious ideas that listens to the client with the patient. But in other contexts, it may refer to the actual presence of a spirit, or more thickly, by way of reference to specific religious and social doctrines and histories, including the notion of Eucharistic presence in the Catholic traditions, and the Ministry of Presence is usually under, understood to come out of a specifically French mystical practice around uh, the Eucharist and the uh, mystical uh, interaction with uh, the Presence uh, in the Eucharist. But also the felt presence of Jesus in Protestant pietist traditions and the distinctive understanding of the presence of the divine in Jewish teaching. So all of these specific references are there for those who can see them. And also psychotherapeutic notions of transference, or the usually more broadly humanistic language of such traditions as the hospice movement. So one Jewish chaplain, speaking of the response of the chaplain in the context of disaster relief, summarizes this distinctive orientation of pastoral care. Words do not have to be said. 
Giving a bottle of water to a thirsty person speaks volumes about not being forgotten. Maintaining a calm presence at the bedside does not remove fear. It lessens isolation. Remember about freaking out. To be with a person at a time of need is to honor the survivor's humanity, the inherent dignity endowed by the Creator. Teaching others how to be present and how to listen to those in distress is a divine-like intervention that spreads the safety net of care and concern. This continues to be typical in the United States that Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish themes dominate, even when the effort and even the practice is broadly intended to be ecumenical, or what is now called multi-faith across a very wide spectrum. So US chaplains identify with and are endorsed by many different American religious communities, mostly varieties of Christianity, but not exclusively so. And increasingly, they regard the object of their solicitude as sharing not their particular religious commitments, but rather a more generalized spirituality, as well as a right and a need to have the space to develop and exercise that faculty, one that's increasingly recognized by the government. So as with Reverend Graystra, the professional work of these chaplains takes place outside of conventional church spaces and moves across the diverse religious terrain of the United States where Americans find themselves manifesting itself broadly in what is called ministry of presence, non-proselytizing and non-coercive. And as with her work as well, the work of these chaplains reflects the particular interdependence of religion and law in the 21st century in the United States, an interdependence that we might call governance through spiritual care. So the practice of spiritual care brings together the chaplain, the client, and the secular institution in a collaborative performance of kind of religious suspended animation. The chaplain works outside of the hierarchical discipline of his sending religious body. The client is away from her home congregation if she has one. And the institution, whether governmental or non-governmental, has an opportunity to further its mission in ways that it often cannot do itself directly. So that encounter is, I hope I've shown, more important and more complex than might be imagined. There is a risk of capture, of course, but it's not easily reduced either to an exercise of state power or a byproduct of neoliberalism. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. This is on? Okay, very good. So um, we have one mic back there. Uh, if you have questions, and then you'll share my mic up here. So any questions from the audience? Hello? Um, um, so I've read that there are now a bunch of Masters of Divinities and Buddhist studies. Yes. And I'm wondering how that fits in, if that's become a popularized chaplain track itself. Yes, yeah, so there are both um, Buddhist seminaries, if you like, who offer MBIP degrees. Um, and then you know, some of the bigger university divinity schools, like Harvard, uh, offers uh, tracks that are not Christian or Jewish that, uh, in various religious traditions. Um, so increasingly, because the MBIP degree is required, it has become uh, a more common degree, even among traditions that have. The Mormons, for example, Mormons don't have a formal ministry in the same way that other Christian churches do, and uh, but they have had to develop the MDiv degree in order to serve in the military as chaplains. Uh, so there's a way in which this this new um, requirement is kind of driving changes in the way uh, religious leaders are trained and recognized in religious communities beyond the Protestant churches where they, where they originated. I hope that helps. So do, uh, do Asian cultures have something equivalent to chaplain? So uh, today, um, 
many countries in the world, um, insofar as they are all uh, basically modern states, have the role of the chaplain. These are not, uh, this is a role that is not uh, natural outside of the medieval Catholic Church, <laughs> um, but it is a role that has become kind of necessary in a sense. This is what I have, by the way in which secular governments seek to uh, acknowledge and govern through a recognition of the need, spiritual needs of their populations. Um, so I was uh, teaching at the University of Chicago when, maybe uh, 15 years ago, and we had a, a really interesting application from a young woman who, from Pakistan who had gone to college in the northeast of the United States, I uh, can't remember, Wesley or somewhere, and she'd encountered the college chaplain, which she'd never encountered in uh, the context of Pakistani universities. And she thought, this is what we need. We need a college chaplain, because she was really impressed with the, the, the work that come. Um, and she wrote to us and she said, you don't, know how to, you don't have to teach me how to be a Muslim. I'm already, you know, that's not. But what I want to learn is how to be a chaplain. Um, and really, at that time, most American uh, programs like the University of Chicago Divinity School really were not uh, ready to, to make that move. But that is happening now. So that, um, and this is true in Europe as well. So that uh, Muslim chaplains are being trained all across Europe and the United States. But also, the chaplain is being adopted in, uh, in Asian countries as well. Other questions? Uh, I think I heard you infer that chaplaincy is uh, being used farther and wider than maybe it was when it started. Yes. And so I wonder if you see uh, a, a time coming when chaplains become uh, the primary uh, conveyors of spiritual and or religious belief in our society, and is it possible that uh, that has some effect on the current dis-ease between uh, government and religious practice as it was shown, for instance, in America, the American Healthcare Act or in uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop or any of those kinds of things? Does that provide a a model for accommodation, do you think? It does, I think, in some ways, in the sense that, um, you know, certainly if you look at military chaplaincy, particularly the Army, there's an incredible, impressive, incredibly impressive diversification of military chaplaincy in the Army. So Army bases in the U.S. have, um, for example, dedicated spaces for Wiccan practitioners, um, and they accommodate a very wide range of religious practice. Um, the Army is the most democratic of the um, military services. Um, so I think that is the case. But if you um, if you talk to the sort of outsiders within that group, because they always are outsiders, the ones who don't qualify because their religion is not considered compliant with, um, with uh, either the requirement to be accommodating to other religious traditions or have uh, some kinds of policies that uh, disagree with uh, not just the army, this would be true in any secular institution. You have a disciplining of religion in which religion runs the danger of no longer being able to be a moral witness outside of the state. Um, I think that's where the risk is. But uh, I, I can't see the future. I don't know what's. Uh, I mean, I think you know, if you look at human history, religion is taken in many, many, many varied forms, and it doesn't seem likely to die. Although people you know, in the middle of the 20th century thought it was going to die, it doesn't seem to be going to die. So, so I, I don't think it'll be entirely captured by government. Um, there will always be ways in which people find uh, religious spaces outside of. So I actually think she kind of asked my question, but just in a different way, you answered it as well. But I'll just ask it again. So based on what you're seeing, uh, my question was, um, how do you see the chaplaincy evolving? So, kind of 
kind of said you can't see the future, but maybe based on what you're seeing now, how do you see some of this trends and stuff, uh, and with respect to the chaplaincy, how do you see it evolving? So one way to, to sort of, you know, look at that question a different way is to ask about how religious communities are evolving, how congregations are evolving, the decline in some ways of, of uh, congregations in this country. Um, so that decline, of course, has led to a sort of precariousness in the capacity of people to make a living as pastors. Um, one of the attractions of being a chaplain is that you get a regular paycheck and sometimes benefits, not always, but you do in some context. And that's not negligible. Nobody should think it is. Um, you need health care for your family, and then working uh, for the government may, may make more sense than taking the risk of setting up a, a congregation. Um, so um, it's, I, I don't think people, you know, because American religion is so disorganized, so incredibly disorganized. Nobody knows any answers to the questions of how many this, how many that, you know, what the trends are. They make things up when they say those things. Um, there's no way of counting uh, how many of any religion is in this country because we don't keep track of that because we don't believe in it. Um, and so that sort of aspect of free religion makes it both sort of fun and interesting to study, but also very hard to say with a great deal of certainty. Um, but I do think that um, the young people who become chaplains are not just young people, but other people who uh, make career changes who become chaplains. It's not just the security of having a regular clientele and a paycheck, which is not nothing. I think there's a real attraction to uh, the challenge of meeting people where they are at really difficult times of their lives and um, of providing that kind of primary spiritual care, if you like. That's um, a really, in some ways, thrilling and fulfilling way to minister. Whereas um, being a you know a pastor, sticking with people for 40, 50 years, either so now it's a different kind of um, religious ministry. And people are not quite as stuck in the same place as before. So that's shifting. I don't know. I think it's very difficult to predict. Um, Other questions here? easier to develop these institutional chaplaincy because you know there was a time for people my age when religion was religion nobody ever talked about spirituality but there seems to be this resistance probably to the institutionalization of religion so spirituality has now become the kind of catch-all term and it seems like as a cultural phenomenon that's made it easier for these legal changes to occur. Is that one way of thinking about it, or am I well, way off base? No, absolutely. No, absolutely. I think that is partly what happened. Um, I think the spirituality, of course, has a very old pedigree uh, within Christian churches, um, certain kinds of contexts. Um, but um, that spirituality as a generalized uh, description of universal religious practice is a relatively new. And, and it does solve some problems about religious diversity, and it also solves the problem, so those who say that they're spiritual but not religious seem to be making a critique of what we call organized religion, and trying to have, in a sense, uh, the good parts of religion without the bad parts of religion. That's one way I say it. It seems it's, it's a way to kind of tidy up religion and get rid of the things that concern people, hierarchy, organization, institutions. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's right. And I think that's what makes, so to the extent that we understand um, you know, our reluctance to establish religion as, as expressed in the Constitution as being the result of 
religion being understood to be divisive and to give rise to conflict in society. So that's one way, one reason that religion is supposed to be kept separate from politics because religion makes problems. But spiritual spirituality doesn't. <laughs> right. And so that's that should concern those of you who promote spirituality. Um, but um, but I think that's why judges can say, oh look, sure, this isn't a problem. You know, we don't have to worry about this anymore because the bad parts of that produce conflict and that makes no problem. Winnie, along with those lines and that question, can you say a little bit about spirituality as been a subject for um, people in the medical profession and um, psychology and those professions and how that's influenced the judge? Yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, one of the things that's curious is that judges read the same stuff the rest of us read about um, uh, increase in spirituality and also the kind of universal need. This is you know, there's no question that uh, another part of this, maybe is what Linda's referring to, is that um, a real shift in, um, in, in med U.S. medicine occurred to a kind of reaction to the over scientization of, of U.S. medicine. And that sort of, uh, it, it came to be that patients really felt like they were just uh, the objects of medical interventions that didn't play, pay attention. And the critique of American medicine, which was done largely by nurses. My sister's a nurse, so I have a soft spot for the work that nurses do. And nurses said, look, you, you know, you're not making the patients well, we're making the patients well, and that's because we have a sense of them as whole people. So that critique of um, this over scientization of US medicine is one of the way, one of the, the um, motives for the turn, I think, within hospital settings towards spiritual care. Back to a holistic understanding of, of, of how medicine should be practiced. That's one, one, one way in which this came back into hospitals. These trends all sort of came together. Other questions? Well, I have one question. Oh, you have one question back here? Oh, I'll see one I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, maybe you can comment to what I, I'm going to say. I'm uh, with a group called Veterans for Peace. Okay, and I uh, noticed in the last several years that uh, veteran service organizations such as the Marine Corps League, American Legion, have chaplains. And these aren't your trained chaplains but they serve a really important function. I also have a member in our group who went through a, uh, a crisis with his uh, suicide. And, uh, and he is an atheist, but a VA chaplain who had training in uh, counseling uh, helped him get through his dark night. And I see more of it coming. Uh, the suicide rate, it's 22 veterans a day. Uh, and there's more, there's a need for the, the trained and the untrained chaplain. And I've been to a training, a chap pastoral training and chaplain training at the American Legion Hall here locally. So uh, it's a, as a suicide prevention tool, I think it's uh, it's essential that uh, chaplain chaplain say. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I I do think um, you know stepping back, we might look at this proliferation of chaplains as responding to some kind of spiritual crisis in American mind. I mean, and a great deal. Of, I have a, a friend who um, who actually studies something very different from. Mine. And he read the book manuscript, and that was his immediate reaction. He's a historian who studies European history, and he said that what he mainly took away from this was the amount of pain um, that was being um, was, was displayed in this story, and the sort of crisis of pain and spiritual crisis. And I think so. I think that there is a sense in which the proliferation of chaplains and chaplains, as as you say, um, 
intervening in, you know, perpetual war and other aspects of this uh, part of, of the story of Venture. And you could say, you know, they, people say that the Supreme Court supports the Constitution and the way it's interpreted is always following the culture. In other words, the culture is ahead of the court. They're not changing things, they're just catching up. So there's a way in which American law is catching up with these changes. Thank you very much. Questions? So, Winnie, could you tell us a little bit about your new center? Linda's asked me this four times today. She's trying to find out if I say the same thing every time. <laughs> and, and, and all, or they can make my answer better. Um, so, um, I'm very fortunate to be in this department at Indiana University, which right now is a very strong religious studies department. And several of us in the department just received a large grant from the Lewis Foundation um, for a project we're calling Being Human. And it's in a way, a, uh, a way to think about uh, or change the conversation about religion uh, away from the you know, polarized, politicized way in which we talk about religion in this country, where it's been reduced to you know, uh, certain attitudes towards sexuality and reproduction and uh, abortion rights, um, and to talk about um, religion and the human um, across many uh, in the uh, sort of try to restart a conversation about religion and human um, that addresses both climate change, um, kinds of the, the uh, ways in which being human is challenged by uh, the border between human and animals, human and technology, uh, how those challenges are posing challenges, crises to our who we are as humans, and trying to think through the ways in which religious language and religious ways of thinking about the human might address those concerns on the one hand, and then also, of course, uh, political challenges uh, to communal life on the planet and how uh, new ways of thinking about religion also uh, address those uh, and trying to get away from this highly polarized ways in which we talk about religion in the U.S. today. So, how's that? You can go home with an A. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions here tonight? If not, uh, if you're interested in World Wisdoms, we have an information table back there, our website's back there. If you're interested in working with us on the next Gans lecture, see me or one of the board members. And then if we can give uh, a round of applause. Thank you.